You're listening to Get to Know World of Warships, a podcast created by Bogsy and Synpax. Welcome back to Get to Know World of Warships, everybody, hosted by Bogsy and Borla. My name is Bogsy, here, of course, with Borla. Hello, Borla. Hey, Bogsy. How are you today? I'm good. I'm a little stuffed up, so if I sound like, you know, if I sound like a, a kid who plays magic cards during lunch at school, you know. Uh, I, I, I like to play black decks with green, uh, but, you know, sometimes I just go green exclusive. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I actually did that, by the way. When I was a kid, I played, in middle school, I played magic cards during lunch with my friends. Uh, so that wasn't, that, w- that was a, not an impression of someone else. That was a, an impression of 13-year-old Bugsy. That was actually 12 to 13-year-old Bugsy, yeah. Um, he was a real charmer, that guy. Um <laughs> But um, anyway, we have a, a fun guest. We have another clan on board today rather than just us talking or talking, you know, with a specific member. We're actually back to talking to a clan. We'll be talking to AK, the Armored Knights, today. Um, before we do that, the end of clan battles, season 13, is almost upon us. How, uh, if, if you had to, I don't know, man, if you had to describe this season in one sentence, what do you think it would be? I'm going to put you on the spot. I would say that this season has an ever-shifting meta. Because of the changes in the rules, we saw an early adjustment, then a couple weeks in, we had a second adjustment. And I feel, actually, I don't feel like the data shows it. We track all this stuff. We finally have a CV season where most of the teams at the very top are running two battleships. Very interesting, right? Yeah, I, you know, I whether it was on purpose or accident or dumb luck that Wargaming finally struck on a group of rules between Cyclones and banning particular CVs, we've gotten to the point where I think last week, among the Hurricane teams that we faced, 85% exactly ran two Battleship. Wow. Yeah, who would have guessed that if you were to take a look at uh, what was the last one tier ten with a CV? That was the that was the that was the Richtofen season. That was season eleven, right? Yeah, I don't think yeah. So guess that. yeah, yeah. So I guess a lot of people are probably glad to see that. I actually, we are running one division in KSC right now as we're pushing to close the season. So I did a little bit of murking this past week for oh. our KSE folks. So it's kind of nice. We got to play uh, Sunday. I played with our, our buddy Jumka, who is from England. He's the caller for one of the divisions. Mm-hmm. And I played for Danny Love, who I think is an Irishman. I think he's an Irishman. He or Wales, one of the two. But yeah, oh, it was kind of fun yeah, to, uh, to mix up. He'll, I'm sure he'll remind you after you uh, threw it. He's either Irish or he's Welsh, one of the two. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So or Scottish. Um, <laughs> but all the same. <laughs> Sorry, Danny. It's kind of one of the nice things is, and I'm sure you guys experience this, you tend to run into the same 10 or 12 clans over and over again later, second half of the season. So it's kind of nice for me because all of a sudden I'm playing all these clans that I was not used to playing against. You get a little bit of variety. You see some comps and metas. The meta's a little different because I believe we were playing some Typhoon 2 games. So it was a really fun time. Got my uh, 30 wins. I have 30 Typhoon wins every single season of Clan Battles ever. (sighs) Wow. I, uh, I don't want to call you a tryhard, but uh, when are you going to buy me uh, one of those fancy skins? I've only got one. I've got the Stalingrad skin for the clan battle tokens. I mean, I'm talking to a guy who has the Palm Tree Atlanta and the Steel Yamato. And the so. Steel Yammy! Hell yeah! I even bought the Norse camo for the Siegfried and the Aegir, even though they come with permanent camos, just because I like those camos. That's the kind what of whale I am. What a flex. What a flex. Well, and Late Light calls you tiny. He does call me tiny, and yet I am the biggest whale in the entire world. Uh, but so speaking of uh, kind of like a refreshing matchmaking, um, Antonius Jones, who is one of the three leaders of TNG and is one of our primary callers, he also found himself having an f- absolutely fantastic time working to TNG three and helping sort of organize things there a little bit. And he absolutely adored the Storm two Storm one matchmaking that he said that he was getting. Um, and he actually said that it was different. It was very different than what we were experiencing up in um, Typhoon 1, where basically all you face is Hurricane and Typhoon clans. Um, so uh, we were just talking about that earlier with our guests, actually. 
about how the meta is different depending, of course, where you're at. So maybe we can get them to weigh in on that a little bit. Why don't we introduce uh, our guests? Yeah, how are you guys doing today? Rabbitkin, Fear? I am doing great. Uh, really enjoying the opportunity to be on the podcast. Thanks for having us on. Absolutely. Yeah, I really appreciate it, guys. Of course. So, well, so hopefully afterwards you guys don't feel like uh, I ran into a uh, quick story box. Sorry to interrupt us right getting into our guests, but last week I was playing a game and somebody gave me a shout out. I think it's uh, Broski F gave me oh, a Broski shout out F, yeah. saying, yeah, how great it was on the podcast. He loves the podcast and everything. And we got stuck in a game where I took a ton, I tanked a ton of damage in a Salem and we were working to win, but I, I died earlier in the match than I should have. I, I didn't have a horrible game, but it, it was a little subpar. And he just typed in all chat, never meet your heroes. <laughs> Which I thought was a pretty good troll. That was a good troll, man. I like it. So hopefully these guys, uh, if they're fans of the podcast, are still fans of the podcast after their episode. Well, I can't wait to see the disappointment on their faces uh, or in their voices since I can't see their faces. So Rab, why don't you tell us a little bit about your clan, the Armored Knights? All right, so uh, one thing that's really interesting about our clan, I think uh, we did some uh, straw polls, and we found out the average age is 55. I'm 36, personally. I'll have to ask Fear how old he is. But uh, we're a casual clan. Uh, one of the things that makes us unique is we uh, the, we have requirements to play on the Alpha team, but no requirements to play on the Bravo team. And uh, the main thing that we're looking for is a good personality match and the willingness to learn. And we have a training program that has three phases. Start off with one, and I've been gradually adding uh, more material to it between the seasons. Actually, one of your uh, clanmates, uh, Kalen, uh, used to be a clanmate of ours and actually helped me develop that uh, the training plan. He was really helpful with the certifications, and we had to throw a couple out that were just unrealistic, and he uh, gave me real good feedback all the way through. He's a real good candidate you have. How about that? He's also a Canadian, so he's a Canadian candidate. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of right. one of our guys in KSD who has been around our group for a long time came from Armored Knights too. I don't know if you guys were around back in 2018, ASR 37. Oh, it's yeah. good but good buddy of mine and uh he doesn't play a whole lot of ships anymore, but he's still in KSD. Yeah, no, he uh, he was one of our great guys, so, you know, he, I remember he wanted to step out and try something a little more competitive and I'm really glad he took the opportunity. Yeah, he's a great guy. So why don't we go ahead and ask you guys to um, give us a little idea about these training phases that you were mentioning. Now, I took a look at the documents. I have the documents right here. Hold on. Let me uh, let me take out my pretend glasses, unfold them, put them on my eyes, and then pull my head back a little bit like I'm having a hard time seeing. Ah, okay. So this is basically... Uh, an indicator for people of where to begin learning things. I noticed you have uh, some links to some YouTubers, to some streamers, to some content creators who, you know, sp specifically work uh, with, or I suppose, specialize in certain ship lines and stuff like that. Um, so, number one, why don't you tell us why exactly it was that you went to the trouble of making something like this, and then, uh, yeah, let's, let's just start there. Okay, I think... Uh... One of the things that I've learned is, uh, I think it's a common quote, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So one of the things that I uh, found out is, you know, I just recently have, uh, you know, my son's two and a half years old. And right around the time I was making this, you know, he was a baby at the time. So my time was extremely lim limited as the uh, clan training officer. So I had to come up with a la carte training. So essentially... Uh, rather than going through this individually and uh, having you know multiple training sessions a week, uh, I came up with a basic frame of reference. Uh, so a lot of it is like uh, the World War ships, uh, how-to videos, how it works. That really does tell you a lot of the basics. And then, like you said, I try to give people links to uh, streamers like uh, Potato Quality that does you know play-by-play. He's more battleship focused, uh, not so much nowadays, but uh, he. he uh, Destroyer Crew of Shikai. It was a really good reference. He did a lot of play-by-play -play for Destroyer Play. Ash Kantz is a great CV reference. And then I would say that uh, uh, we're still looking for a good cruiser one, but of course I have like Flamu and uh, any any individual uh, any individual ship that I, you know if I find like good replays, I'll I'll put them in there and add it to the thing. And the idea behind it is if you were familiar and already. Uh, 
aware how the topic worked. You didn't have to read the video or you didn't have to rewatch the video. So I think uh, at one point I had 50 or 60 videos and I, I kind of trimmed it down between the seasons and just kind of gave people general references. But it goes everything from beginner to advanced tactics and uh, it really helped. And then one of the things that we did with phase two is it mostly just is around like 1v1, 2v2 uh, situations. So like uh, in a radar cruiser, for example, you would have to take out a, uh, a destroyer that's going after a cap. So both you'd have a destroyer on the other side, radar cruiser on the other, uh, on the other team. And the uh, goal was to, you know, not die to the torps, uh, use your cooldowns effectively, when to kite, when to go away, and uh, just give people active, uh, constructive feedback. And one of the cool things about certifications is once you're certified, then uh, you can certify someone else. So that took some of the stress off of me as a trainer because I could have, you know, uh, 10 to 15 people available to train you at any given time. And uh, phase three was more of the larger group environments, like four and four and greater, just mostly seen like, you know, a lot of people that get tunnel, tunnel vision, they're good at focusing on one or two ships at a time, but then they forget about the battleship that's on their flank. So that's kind of what phase three focuses on is situational awareness, how to angle to multiple targets and when to engage and disengage. So you made, the, here, this is what really caught my eye was the, you set up scenarios on, hey, here, you need to be able to out 1v1 somebody. Um, that yes. Was, that was a little surprising to me just because um, I in my mind, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. In my mind, my very reactive mind, I sort of went like, "One v one." Well, that's not that's not how games are played. Like that's not how clan battles are played. But then I sort of remembered, I remembered the um, the one v one. God, I guess at sometimes it was a brawl. Sometimes it was a ranked sprint. But they've they've included some one v one game modes throughout the years. And every time I played those, I remember realizing just how much more effectively I realized the the maximizations and limitations of a ship. Um, like, the 1v1 I always noticed, I, I started to find out, okay, Prince Eugen is unusually strong because most people are bringing turpets because they think they can just rush somebody and torp them, but it's like, but the, the Prince Eugen essentially beats a turpets in almost every situation because of the way the armor and the torpedo angles work. And I went, oh... And then I started to think about how those things worked across multiple scenarios. So I actually started to see, oh, I, I, can, I can see how this would be very interesting. I'm kind of curious, how exactly is it you certify somebody in that? Do you, do you just sort of watch them and go, okay, you, 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 you achieved the end, you beat the DD one-on-one, -on -one, or you kept him out of the cap, or are you looking for very specific instances of, okay, he knows when to use radar, he knows when to not use radar, he knows how to blind fire, um, he knows how to position, he knows how to bait, a cruiser's radar uh, while contesting a cap and then get out and then, you know, cap again. What, what, what sort of thing are you doing for that? Yeah, the the main thing that you hit on is uh, there's a couple skills like torpedo joust, I call them, is how to close the distance while being angled and uh, when to launch your torps because, you know, most people early on when they're learning, they'll go full broadside, launch their tube, tubes and die before they can and hardly get any hits because they're launching them three, four, five km out or whatever the max range is like in a Tirpitz or a, a German cruiser. Uh, the other one was like a smoke firing uh, practice. So show them a video on how to do it and then uh, basically uh, give them an opportunity to shoot at somebody in smoke and then they have to get... I think uh, one of them was like 30 or 40 hits in... Um, at a two minute period. Uh, so mostly just practicing on those uh, fundamentals like the gun joust is also my favorite for both battleships and cruisers. Uh, learning how to angle and then pre-turn your gun so you can take someone out in one one strike. But uh, as far as how people get certified, it's usually uh, whoever you're playing against is the one that's certifying you. And uh, usually the qualification uh, is to kill them. So if you don't kill them, then they keep giving you feedback um, and we even have comms active so you can talk back and forth like oh you shouldn't have re repaired that single fire or um you know you should uh, be angling or you know we'll, we'll try to give them constructive feedback while they're doing it and if they're able to kill the trainer then they're certified on that task and they can train someone else as boxy and i were looking over this earlier today and chatting there were some things 
in these training plans that I thought were things that a lot of our listeners might appreciate or enjoy. Um, I, you know, Bogsy and I have often talked about who our listeners are, and obviously we, we can't know exactly who they are, but we see a lot of clans in lower typhoon and storm. We know we have some guys in the typhoon and hurricane clans that listen, but it seems like a lot of guys in storm and lower typhoon and people who are coming up through the competitive and want to improve listen. And I think one of the things that you guys did really well uh, is the Athlans and mod pack section. Uh, Do either you want to talk a little bit about kind of the basic principles that you looked at when you put together the notes on that? Uh, yeah, so when I put that together, I was looking at the most used mods and like what are the most effective. I think Navigator by far is the most important mod you can use in the game just because it tells you your um, angle your angle relative to whatever ship you have logged on uh, locked onto, and uh, that makes a huge difference for uh, you know being able to bounce shells uh, whether you're showing too much broadside because you can quickly switch between targets. Uh, that is really really good a lot of people don't know how to read smokestacks so like i explained both how to do it and also uh, the stoplight mod is really uh, influential uh, i think regen assistant is really critical because it tells you how much you can heal for and how much um, how much damage you've taken so a lot of people uh, wait uh, waste their heals um, and i'm trying to remember what was the other critical mod that i had i'll have to take a look yeah, I think some of these things are very powerful and people, if they're not running Mod Station or Aslans and they're trying to play competitive and they're trying to get better, would really benefit from it. It's information that is in the game, but not always easy to get. Like you said, there's the smokestack things that you can look at, the angles you can see on the minimap and things like that, but you don't get the hard numbers for it. So I really think for clans like yours or others who are trying to become more competitive uh, you know we have training sessions weekly during the season and we we have a thing in our discord that shows a lot of these same things that you guys do um some of the one of the other things that people may remember the tier six clan battle season um with the huang haze that we're running we were early adapters of that and the blind fire hitting smoke like just practicing that it's amazing how much better you can get with a little bit of practice so i think it's it's really good that you guys are putting these things together especially coming from a background where I, i'm guessing a lot of your members are people who are so like you said earlier somewhat casual but they're wanting to compete a little bit is that pretty accurate yeah that is pretty accurate i mean we've always been active in terms of clan battles at one point uh I think early on there, you know, they, everybody, Fear could probably talk more about it, but, you know, they did participate in Supremacy League. And when I joined the clan about in 2018, we had consistent two to three teams running uh, any time. Um, and I think that stayed pretty consistent up until the first CV season. <laughs> and then we went down to one one team running at all times. <laughs> well, it's difficult when you, need a, when you need a competent CV player at all times, isn't it? Right. Yeah. One of the things we found is uh, the best players uh, for CV were also our main battle callers. And, uh, you know, we've tried calling from CVs, and it's pretty difficult. I can call from any ship except for CV. I can off-call flanks from CVs, but it's it's a lot to manage. Uh, so we had a lot of burnout. And actually, this season, one of our other officers, uh, Greatopian, had came up with a uh, caller rotation. So we just call it, like, you'll have a specific caller for a two-hour block of time, and then someone will take over for the second half of the night. And that's really helped us out a lot. Well, that's yeah, I think Yeah, I think just organizing clan battles and having a schedule like that would be helpful to a lot of clans. So you guys split the session in half, you're saying? Yeah. Yes. So you have a caller for uh, the main uh, first half and the second half, and that's we usually have two callers a night. Okay. So question for Fear, you're the commander. Did you found armored knights, or how did armored knights get off the ground? No. Uh, so it was actually founded by a good friend of mine who uh, was in the uh, navy. He's retired since. I'm still active duty. Uh, but him and I came up playing games, uh, and even when we were separated by duty stations, gaming was always something we could come back to. Um, you know, we remember doing LAN parties, you know, way back when, um, you know, lugging the big machines around and all that fun stuff. But uh, 
throughout that time, we played a lot of first-person shooters and started coming into uh, World Tanks when that started becoming bigger. Uh, that's when he founded uh, Armored Knights to put together uh, mostly a tanks platform with a few side games. When uh, Warships uh, started to make itself known, quite a few of us jumped in at that point, uh, you know, when it was just getting started. Discovered, hey, this could actually be a really fun game. We should put something together. So we did, and we, you know, con- uh, conceived of our, our Warship side of the house. Um, so I've been active in that portion of it since uh, since day one, pretty much. And then it's just kind of evolved uh, from that time. We were a part of Supremacy League, like uh, like he mentioned. So that was something that one of the first moments for us to realize, you know, hey, this whole, you know, clan versus clan thing. I mean, this could be pretty impressive. Uh, we could have a lot of fun with this. And Supremacy League, for the number of seasons it went, um, was was it really was. It was a ton of fun, uh, you know, player led and uh, player involved. So, well, so. I want to ask you guys one last question before we move off the topic of your um, sort of your your vetting system. Um, you know, this is there are a number of different sort of tests or trials that you seem to put people through before they become certified to sort of play a specific role in your clan battle team. So my question is, on average, about how much time would you say you put into each person? Um, into certifying each person like what's your time commitment for your clan members in order to sort of just test to see if someone is good enough to play these boats so usually to get qualified like on a cruiser uh phase one is kind of you take it as you go i don't make people go i say you start working on it let me know when you finish and then uh for phase two for you know to get certified in a cruiser i would say on average takes about an hour and a half to two hours of game playing usually to get through those certifications i think some of the you know more competent players got through it in uh probably 30 to 45 minutes for an individual ship class Mm -hmm. and uh to get through everything um you're probably looking at like five to six hours of training and i think out of the 60 people that have gone through certification training i only had uh two people that kind of struggle with it um and one was because, uh, you know, he had physical limitations that was that were, uh, you know, he had real bad vision and uh, he had some health issues that were complicating. But he got through the certification and one that uh, didn't work for uh, different reasons. Oh, I see. OK. Well, um, so several hours of work obviously go into each person that you guys certify. So I suppose I'm, I'm thinking about this, of course, as my. You know, as someone who does the recruiting for my clan, TNG, I I generally, I I would say I never have that amount of time to put into a prospective person coming in. (laughs) I I sort of delegate it by, I sort of look at somebody's stats, generally speaking. I mean, if, you know, stats don't have to be purple or blue across the board or anything like that, for sure. You know, uh, there are some excellent people I know with green stats who are better than, you know, half the people out there with purple stats in terms of how to understand um, clan battles and whatnot. But at least it's a place to start. I would I would have to see something really impressive from a person with orange PR to consider them like, re- you know, ready to play typhoon level clan battles. I'd say, what on earth happened there? Um, but at the same time, I, I sort of bring folks in, have them play with a few people, and then we put them with a crew either in TNG 2 or 3 or something like that. And, uh, you know, one where they get a chance to play at, you know, a decently high Storm 1, Typhoon 3, 2 level. Um, And then I sort of just wait for feedback, to be honest with you. Unless there's someone familiar to me whom I know came from a strong clan or something like that. And it's like, okay, well, I think you have an idea of what you're doing. Um, So I think it's cool that you guys actually, you know, you guys actually created a, a system in which you can actually vet people directly to find out rather than sort of rely on a a larger system that does that for you i think it's great that you guys actually managed to come up with that and and wrote it down so it's easily um, referred back to but what i'm really interested about is how exactly it is you guys have an average age of 55 in your clan how is that possible um yeah i i think it's uh partly the draw because we do have a lot of uh military folks uh either former or retired um, so a lot of the folks started even from the get go that were, uh, you know, former military members. And I think that's where it kind of, you know, you, we built a pack that was kind of around probably a later thirties, up, upper forties crowd. And I, I think the draw just kind of stayed there for quite a while. Um, 
And, and I mean, it's worked out fine. You know, I mean, for for a clan like ours that you know kind of puts the social aspect ahead of the uh, the competitive piece of it. I think that's the other aspect of it too. Is you're bringing in people that you know they may want to go through these training scenarios like Rapikins put together for us, um, and some of them just want to come play with a bunch of good you know good folks, and that's all they really want to do. Sure. And I think we we yeah. give them the best of both worlds with that. Or at least I, I hope so. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, fear. Do you know of anybody from your uh, from your from your community there who is taking part? Anyone who's a veteran is taking part in the Verizon Warrior training? Uh, uh, actually, we had a couple people. Didn't we? Maybe. Uh. I think we had a couple people that were playing in like the more casual parts of the tournament, but I'm mm-hmm. not sure if any of them played in the uh, the, the competitive. But uh, yeah, I agree with Fear. Uh, for the most part, the uh, one of the things that's unique about uh, us is we don't have any stat requirements. But we, when you play with us and you show up on our Discord, you apply on the website. Usually, we have to play with you for like four to five days, maybe a week before you usually get in. So we have like a real tight knit group and. We just really try to vet for personality. And uh, one of the things I'd like to point out with, like, Lee, who's one of our officers in our clan, he probably started off around, like, a 30% win rate, and we've gotten him up to 45. (laughs) So uh, the the training definitely works. Uh, I was hoping that it would get us to, like, Typhoon. Usually we finish, you know, middle storm. Sometimes we get close to getting into Typhoon. But uh, it definitely helps people get from basics to, like, uh, like, storm competency pretty quick. Sure. Well, so I, so I have a question around the social aspect. If you're if you're looking for somebody, somebody's looking for a clan, they are interested in Armor Knights after hearing you guys talk. What types of things do you guys do together socially that keep the guys wanting to hang out with the Armor Knights? I think one of the requirements that we have is you have to play six division games a week. Um, of course, you know if you have real life. Uh, think uh, commitments and you have something that comes up like you know fear was deployed to uh, greece for a year recently and uh you know we'll save your your spot keep keep your spot in the clan but other than that we uh mostly just play a lot of divs together uh, a couple of us play different games uh elite dangerous is one eve is what uh fear plays uh but for the most part we're always divving together and uh you know if there's ever a, a mix, like we always try to keep people in, included. So we've brought recruits into clan battles. We've brought, uh, we, we try to play Bravo pretty consistently. You know, if we, if we had like enough for two alpha teams, but we had like a mix of alpha and Bravo players, we'd always have a Bravo team and an alpha team. That way everybody would get to play. So we try to be as inclusive as possible. I think the other thing we try and do is, uh, we run clan events, uh, as often as we can. Um, that that I um, can tell you got a little little mixed up because uh, Wargaming suddenly decided they wanted to have events every other day uh, for a while. There felt like um, grind, but grind was, harder, boys. Grind oh, harder. Grind harder. Okay. Yeah. Clan battles gets done, and now it's you know this, that, and the other thing. So, but but in between all that, we do try and run. Uh, we'll do like a hunt the officers. Where we'll bring some people in, including the uh, the CO Hammer, uh, who doesn't play a whole lot of ships these days. Um, but uh, if I tell him about it, he's on board all day. You know, hey, come come hunt the CO. Um, you know, for either bragging rights or sometimes we'll give out the balloons or you know one of the new ships that's uh, hitting the stores or whatever. So we do try and uh, you know bring together a, a community aspect of it. Of hey, come out and you know have a good time with the rest of your clan mates. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of clan battles, let's 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 talk a little bit about the meta this season because we're uh, we got. Ooh. Is it four four sessions left? I think yeah, we got four sessions left, and this has been this has been a unique season. I would say I think it'd be fair to say that without too much argument that um, you know in terms of the CV seasons, they've made more attempts this season to actually I don't know I don't even want to use the word balance because I don't want to get any angry emails, but like they've they've made attempts at flattening the I guess sort of like. The, the the ships that have a power spike available, like uh, like the FDR, for example, even Hakuryu. So l- let's let's first start by let's get an idea um, from from the the areas that your clan is in. Because you mentioned you're a semi casual clan. Um, at the level that you guys are playing, w- what was the experience like? What was the sh- the shaping of the meta for you guys throughout the season? What did you first start running into the most in terms of carriers, in terms of battleships? Um, and then, you know, as time went on, what changed for you? And then I'll ask Borla to weigh in as well. 
Okay, uh, I would say that for the most part, uh, everybody saw the Petro limit or restriction coming up. So, tons of Petros, uh, and mostly in Gale and um, was it Gale and Squall? Uh, we we kind of got into Storm, I think the last uh, month and a half. But uh, for the most part, it was mostly Petros. You'd have maybe uh, not a whole lot of DDs. Uh, FDR was pretty uh, popular choice. I'd say we run into CVs probably 60% of the matches initially for that first week. Uh, then going into the uh, second restriction, then, uh, you know, when people started hack sniping, that was uh, pretty entertaining uh, to watch. But uh, once once they got rid of the FDR, the Hakuryu, and limited, you know, Venezia, Stalingrad, and all those ships to one... That's when we started seeing double BB almost 80 80-ish percent of the games that we were in. And it was actually and we actually had the most success switching back to double BB and destroyer seemed to be in a real good place that uh, curving torps bug while turning uh, definitely threw people on their head for a while, but uh, everybody kind of got used to it and I'm hoping they fix that one soon. Uh, <laughs> but I high, I so, I so enjoy the uh, the battleship meta just because you can set up crossfire. I love playing battleships. I love having uh, an off collar in a battleship. It's a lot of fun. What about you, uh, Boyla? I'm curious. I mean, I, I feel like your clan and my clan have generally had the same experience in terms of the other clans that we face. So, give us a little overview from your opinion on on sort of how the meta shaped up over the weeks, if you don't mind. Yeah, at the beginning. Just about everybody we saw was running CVs, speaking specifically about KSC. Um, we were getting 95% plus running CVs. Week three, literally 99% exactly of the team. So maybe we had one game that week that somebody wasn't running a CV. And then immediately when the hack and the FDR were put on the ice, it dropped to 78% and then it dropped again. Another, you know, it was like 63% last the week for last. And now it's basically 50, 50. We're seeing CVs and two battleships and a lot of the really good teams that we're facing, you know, the top handful of teams, they're running two battleship lineups. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people were kind of notorious, you know, cable guy oscons we have some really good cv players and we take advantage of those but right now the the lineup that we're running is two battleships and we also saw an increase especially as the cvs like got dialed down mm -hmm. we saw an increase in kremlin and colombo those have been two battleships that have been used a lot montana as well in, in those it's generally speaking um, Kremlin, Montana, or Colombo, some combination of those three that we see people run. And I do think the variety and diversity that the rule changes um, put out there kind of made the, se the season a little bit more enjoyable, a little more interesting. The, as everybody saw, Petro's really heavy early on, uh, and as those dropped off and were limited, we're still seeing a Petro, but there's it's totally different things you have to do when you're only running one Petro, one Venezia, whatever. So, yeah, it's it's made for a fun season, I think. Yeah, it, it the, the really interesting thing was sort of you, you got a much better sense of what each carrier did to the meta, I thought. Because, you know, for the first couple of weeks, it was FDR and Hack that were really the go-tos. And, and frankly, I was more concerned about seeing FDRs than Hakuryu's. Um, you get... You know, you got the odd Hakuryu CV sniping, sure, but that was one out of every like thirty games, maybe, and that wasn't really wasn't really worth changing up your lineup for. Um, but the the FDR was just, in my opinion, was it's just you you can't you have to stay. There's mobile. no counterplay. There's no counterplay for it. It was so obnoxious because even if they sort of wasted their planes, they've got enough and they can always be capable of doing an enormous amount of damage. So I was, I gotta be honest, I was shocked when I woke up, checked the, you know, the news update and was like, oh, FDR and hack are banned. And I went, holy crap, what's happened? I, I literally, I feel silly like 
laughing to myself outside of the game, you know? Like, I read a piece of news about warships online, and I'm, I'm laughing to myself. But I thought, wow, this is really going to change things. Um, you know, and then it did a bit. You know, Immelman became the next obvious choice for folks who wanted to bring a carrier. Um, but uh, when the cruiser... They were, they were two separate restrictions, right? The carriers first and then the cruisers, right? Or well, we had the Petro, restric Petro restriction was early on down to one, but it was the beginning of week four that the hack and the FDR were limited or removed did from the they, game. Did they limit the other cruisers at the same time? I believe they did. Okay. So all of a sudden, you've just got like this... I, I remember actually I asked Gaishu about it one time specifically. I said, hey, do you think if they made it... I forget where it was, but I said... What do you th do you think you'd see more diversity or less diversity if they limited it so you could only bring one of any particular boat? And he goes, "Oh, I think you'd see the exact same lineup across the board. You know, people would figure out what are the seven best ships you can bring, and they just bring those." <laughs> I, you know, I'm I'm inclined to say that to some degree that is true. Um, it's not entirely true. I'm not trying to disagree with you know Gaishu's assertion, but just in terms of what I've seen. You do generally see people bringing a Stalingrad, a Petro, a Venezia. Not always a Goliath, but sometimes a Goliath. Um, but generally, you will still see those three boats. Um, even if they're limited to one, you will still generally see still see them. So, But I, I, I want to agree with you guys' initial assertion, which was, this has been one of, I would, I would have to argue, this has been the best season of using carriers that we've had so far. And I specifically think it's due to the fact that they took out the hack in the FDR and put a few limits on ships. Hopefully, and this is my hope, that is an indication that they get it and will work on attempting to make those boats less effective in a comp situation. Um, just because it is a tacit acknowledgement that, hey, this is overperforming, or hey, this is being overselected. And if it's being overselected, it's probably because it's overperforming. Um, so that actually gave me a little bit of hope that they might adjust some of the parameters in the future. Did, did uh, Fear and Rab, did you guys get that sense at all? Or, did you, did you, or do you have little faith at this point? Uh, I actually really do like the restriction system. It, it's made a huge difference in the meta and uh, even the lower tier seasons. But... Um... One of the things that was interesting is not only did you have the CV restrictions, but you also had the rocket change that went into effect. So yes. that put MVR in an even worse place. And then, um, I mean, I love the MVR with the uh, accurate reticle. Now the uh, RNGs is, <laughs> uh, you know, spin the wheel, see if you get a, a hit is uh, not very fun. So that used to be one of my favorites. I really enjoy the Immelman. Uh, I call the FDR the flak dodging simulator. I hate that ship. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I would say that, yeah, it's heading in the right direction, but I think uh, Wargaming has to, you know, if the, if you're seeing ships that are constantly restricted or too popular, you're, you're going to have to make adjustments rather than just limiting them. I think that would be the better process to make. And then I hope that the, with the CVs in general, that they at least make the rockets more accurate if you're going to have to have, you know, any between, anywhere between three and second lead times or three and six second. Hmm. So you don't what? you don't think that maybe these were I mean I I understood these rocket changes as being this is to limit the carrier's ability to single-handedly strike and damage and destroy destroyers which just I think all around lowered their effectiveness at actually dealing damage to destroyers which I thought was a really really good choice. Did you guys not see it that way? Uh, so the way that I see it is, you know, when they had an accurate rocket reticle, they could absolutely devastate a DD. You know, they'd hit them for anywhere between 7 and 9k, uh, typically on, uh, per salvo if they, with, you know, the DD not really being able to do much. And then when they make this, ch uh, when they made the reticle change, then you're really only hitting DDs about 3 or 4k on average. And yeah, between player spotting and everything else, uh, the DD could survive if they played smart, if they used their smoke, or if they retreated back to an ally. But now, if you have the four second and the, the you know four to six second lead time, and you can only hit them for three to four, five, three to five k at most uh, damage, I think it it's a little bit weak. 
Oh, okay. So you think that One of the nerf was almost too much? I think it maybe was a little too much. I like the... I don't mind the lead time. I just want the reticle to be more accurate. One of the side effects that surprised me of the CV changes during the season, like, like he mentioned, the rocket was probably, you know, on paper would be as significant as getting rid of those two CVs. But each week we're seeing fewer destroyers than we saw the week before mm. at the top end. I don't know, Bogsy, if you guys feel the same way. Yeah, we but, are seeing fewer. <clears throat> you know, so some of the impact was a little counterintuitive. Like you would think, hey, no more CVs, the, the spotting of the CV and the, being able to hit some of those destroyers being taken away, you're going to see more destroyers. It's kind of been went the opposite direction. People are running more HP in their lineups and running those strong cruisers. Yeah, I think HP definitely has become a premium. Uh, it's been interesting in like ranked, for example, in Silver League. I think you're getting four to five DDs a match. And uh, I don't know what it's like in the Gold League. I try to avoid it. But uh, there, at least in randoms, there's more DDs than there ever has been. And I think that DDs are in a really good place. And I can understand in the high-level competitive. In like the uh, Storm and lower, I would say that we're at least seeing two to three DDs on each side of match. People trying to go for vision control on those lineups. And that's... You know, like I said, Bugsy, it kind of surprised me a little bit that we're seeing with the two battleship lineups, we're not seeing people exploit it with destroyers. We're seeing people just yeah. put more HP on the board, right? Well, that's the funny thing is like, you know, if you're seeing uh, the, the funny thing about it is like, OK, so you're seeing double battleships, you're seeing lots of, you know, uh, lots of Soviet cruisers, which means lots and lots of HP, but also means very large ships that don't turn well. So you'd think you know, this is the time of the Somers. This is the time of the gearing or what have you. And ironically enough, it's just, it's not how it works because there's still the chance that you run into a carrier. And if you run into a carrier, oh, well, especially a Somers, is just, you know, effectively dead on arrival. Um, you know, one could make the argument that maybe it's not just because, well, I guess there aren't. Immelman can deal with destroyers decently well but it's still just the ability to constantly have it spotted and keep it spotted that i think is really the major um you know that's really the major part that prohibits someone from wanting to take one of these uh one of these yeah what well, we're what well, we're seeing a lot of when it comes to destroyers are you yanks because of the smoke and how quickly they can continually smoke so we're seeing a lot of the very best teams run a single you yang we're seeing uh, next to that Marceau's uh, just speedy cat boy, you know, put pressure on by start accumulating points and then show up on the other side of the map. Uh, you see many uh, darings, and I would also say that I think you're seeing less DDs because of that uh, curving torp bug that's really annoying. That's another big part of it. Actually, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I mean, what, what goods the Somers are gearing against a bunch of battleships and heavy cruisers if your torpedoes don't go where they don't go where you tell them to go, you know? Yeah, it's definitely been a lot to adjust to. And it lets you have to, you feel a lot, it stop having, because most people would skirt around the detec detection range uh, uh, while in a full turn uh, send their torps off. But now you have to be, you know, rudder neutral uh, to avoid the bug. And that uh, isn't always feasible. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, you know, we had that huge list of rebalanced ships here in the last dev blog, you know, everything from the Felix Schultz to the Edinburgh to the Jervis, Baltimore. Um, we're all thankful that they didn't touch the Petropavlovsk, right? Yes. <laughs> have yeah. to save that. Would hate to have that casemate reduced to 40 millimeters, wouldn't we? I mean, you can't, can't just raise that up a little bit in the water or do something to make it be able to be shot at because that's the thing you limit to one in every lineup and just about every single lineup brings one exactly <laughs> and have you noticed it's especially uh just how much extra fire you have if you have you know a angled petro how how long it takes to kill one of those compared to a Stalingrad or a Moskva or, you know, any other ship. It's, it's amazing yeah. the punishment that ship can take. You know, what's funny about that though, is I think I, I even had to remind a few people that, um, you know, that we play with that it's like, Hey, people forget this because the Petro effectively replaced the Stalingrad, but 
if you fire HE out of the Stalingrad, you will pen that 50 mil casemate of the uh, of the Petro, unless I'm horribly, horribly mistaken and need to edit this out. <laughs> Won't it? Uh, no, I think you're right. Okay, now I'm going to look. Now I'm going to hold on. It's 242, right? A millimeter? <laughs> Wow's 305 millimeter HE pen. I think it's 40. Our, our research pen. department's working on it right now. Yes. Hold on. And hence, <laughs> I, I love this. Um, for those of you who don't know, we never give anybody on this podcast any actual resources of like, here, go here and look at this. On the wiki.wargaming.net for World of Warships wiki, there is something called armor thresholds. You can literally just type into Google WoW's armor thresholds, and it will pop up this delightful page that has every HE penetration, AP penetration, AP overmatch, um, IFHE without all that. It's got all that information listed out really, really simply. So, um, yeah, so... One day when Bogsy runs Wargaming, he's going to put all this stuff in the game so people don't have to be Google experts to understand basic principles of Hell the yeah, game. Hell yeah, brother. Okay, so what a concept. 50 millimeters of armor is penetrated by an HE shell with standard penetration, i.e. not German, not British, if it has a caliber of 297 millimeters or more. So 305s, whether they are American Alaska guns or Stalingrad guns or Aegir guns or what have you, 305s will pen 50 millimeters of armor with HE. Um, so, yeah, it's all you all your Stalingrads out there who are shooting AP at a you know at a Petra Pavlovsk angled so that you'll never penetrate it. You can actually pen the deck and the upper hull with HE. That's legit. That is 100 percent true. There, we've done our part for society, right, Borla? I, I feel like we're we're doing something every day, Bogsy. Good. Let's make these guys sink a ship. What do you say? Yeah. So, you know how Bogsy loves to play make believe. So we're gonna play <laughs> make believe. <laughs> he make he he makes believe he's a real boy all the time. Aww. Oh. Aww. So, so you guys are there in in the basement. You have the server, wargaming servers, in front of you, and you get to delete one ship out of the game forever. You can't remove carriers. You can't remove subs. I, I, we should make an exception and just remove subs, Bogsy. But you have to pick a single ship. So, Rabbi, one ship gone forever. What would it be and why? I would have to get rid of the uh, flak dodging simulator, uh, even though I've had help from Kalen, who taught me the uh, the stutter and turn, uh, where you, you, know, you can segment your turn so the flak spawns on the outside of whichever direction you're turning. The uh, I even had a... YouTuber helped me out. Uh, dish uh, just dodge llama with hyphens in between the uh, words. He got me from a. He watched me. Pl I gave him a Twitch highlight for like an hour and a half, and he watched me. Uh, uh, gave me critique on what I did wrong, and it went from a twenty-two percent win rate to a forty-five percent win rate. Uh, so, but I, I just can't stand the ship. I love the Immelman. I have like a 60% win rate with that, and it uh, com plays completely opposite because you got those fast planes. But yeah, that would be the one I'd get rid of. All right. Sounds good. If you want to learn more about the Immelman, you can listen to our podcast with Fjordja. He is, uh, man, he plays the Immelman far more than his healthy Bogsy. Yeah, he does. Fjordja, of course, having more games on the NA server in the in the Immelman, I think, than the next, like, what, 20 people combined or something ridiculous like that? I thought it was, like, 87, but 20, oh 20 is probably more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about you, Fear? What, what ship would you sink? Uh, well, you kind of took away my answer. I was going to say subs before they ever get out of the dock. You cannot, you cannot sink an entire <laughs> class or an entire line. You get one or you get nothing, you lose. Good day, sir. <laughs> Uh, I'll be honest, man. I'm I'm quite a bit more of the casual player uh, in comparison to Labrabi. He, he's our numbers guy. Uh, I'm not that guy. Uh, so when I go out, I'm out to have a good time. There's there's no particular ship that I have a distinct hatred for. Are you refusing to sink a ship? Oh, I'll sink them while we're in game, but I don't need to sink. Them. I, I, Has this ever happened before? Is this the first? Is this? Uh, so what you're saying is every ship is a fine ship. Sure. I mean, so look, there's some weaker ones out there and that's fine if they want to come against us, you know, with weaker ships that just gives me more to kill. Can um, can I can I give you some suggestions? 
<laughs> sure, it's your <laughs> podcast. You do. You're right. It is. It is our podcast. Um, yes, sir. I. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> another fine ship is the Fenyang. That's a fine ship that definitely doesn't need to be sunk for being terrible. Another ship is the Flandre. The Flandre is a fine ship. It has undercaliber guns for its for its tier. It has few of them with a very long reload and inaccurate shells. It's a fine ship. Another fine ship is the Tiger 59, which has two-fifths the firepower of a Minotaur, radar it can barely use, and no torpedoes, plus a Citadel the size of my ego. Another fine ship is the Z-31. I, I just... I just want you to consider sinking one of those ships. That's all. It sounds like Boxy wants back. you to buy a Yukon. <laughs> so what sorry. can I do to put you in a Yukon today, sir? It comes with So is heads. there anything you guys want to plug? Anything we haven't talked about? <laughs> <laughs> we got to get Boxy. He's, he's going to have a breakdown. Nobody... Nobody picked the ship. Or fear didn't pick the ship. Somebody refused to sink a ship. This must be what women feel like when we're like, no, nah, I'm not interested. <laughs> uh, so I would say, uh, like you said, the training plan is a good resource. Anybody who's ever had an interest in it in the past, I've always been willing to share. So if someone reaches out to you guys and you want to uh, pass it along to them, you're welcome to. I know phase one in particular is just a really good resource for information. Phase two, you know, it, it just depends on whether it suits people or not but it's a good idea if you do the a la carte training where you get people certified then they train other people and we've had you know a couple where you know they might get certified by as not as strong of a player and then you know they get additional training from us later and i'll have like a officer like myself or someone else that will work with them but uh that's a good resource i'm happy to share it and uh just appreciate your time i think you're going to be putting links to our discord and uh, our website, and we'd love to have uh, more people in AK. Yeah, we'll definitely put those in there, and if people want to talk to you about the training, then they can find you through the Discord or the link. Bogsday, I have some life advice for you at the end. Your uh, uh -oh. thing about sinking a ship made me think about this. So, Do you ever uh, get ready to take Bree out to dinner and ask her where she wants to go, and what is the answer nine times out of ten from every woman that we've all ever known? When when I ask her if she's ready, where do you or... want to go for dinner? Oh, okay, okay, okay. I don't know. That's what they say, right? I don't yeah. know, or I don't care, and then whatever you pick is wrong, <laughs> right? Am I wrong? I I, right? I have definitely experienced this. So here's what you do next time you're going to take Brie out for dinner, and you can't think of a place. Tell her to guess. Tell her she gets two guesses of where you're going to take her for dinner. Ooh, I like this a lot. And then just pick one of her two guesses. That's brilliant. And say, yep, you got it. We're going to, you know, Chef Bogsy's. So it's going to sound something like it's like, hey, Bree, guess where we're going to dinner tonight? You get two guesses. <gasps> is it Chef Bogsy's? It is. I knew you'd only need one. That's amazing. I already made the reservations at Chef, at Chef Bogsy's. You should be like, that's amazing. So that, that's my life advice for you today, Bogsy. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. Um, well, gentlemen, we will definitely have your links down in the description below. Please go check out the Armored Knights. Um, go check out their Discord. Uh, go check out their website. It's unusual for clans to have a website, in my experience, so go check that out. Um, anything else from you, Borla? No, just that Danny the Irishman is actually English, and so that's why I called him Irish, Scottish, Welsh. Oh, I see. So he's going he's gonna to love that troll. Make no mistake, uh, fellas, whether they are Scottish or English or Welsh, they are United Kingdom. However, they are not all English. There is a difference. Make no mistake, because that will get you punched by a soccer hooligan. Excuse me, football hooligan. That will also get you punched. Um, well, I hope you guys all enjoy the last week of clan battles, Boxy. Hope you guys get over the hump and get your snazzy purple tags. Yep, yep. Both of our uh, both of our ratings are in Typhoon One eighty and eighty seven, I think, right now. So we uh, we didn't play as many games this last weekend as we wanted to. Um, so we sort of just crept up 40, 60 points every night, and that honestly, that was great. That was fine. Um, so we'll hopefully be putting those over the hump here in the next two days. But uh, good luck to all of you as you finish out this clan battle season. And uh, thank you all, as always, for listening. Thank you to uh, our guests. We appreciate you guys being here. Rabican and Fear Danube from uh, AK. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, guys. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. We'll see you guys next time on Get to Know World of Warships.